this stuff. What's up? Oh, let me keep doing it. Stop. <laughs> all right. So uh, we talked about all our different primitive types, and again, these are the built-in, uh, basically types uh, uh, types built built into the language that are only capable of holding a value. We have several here. A bunch of them are made for holding whole numbers, whole integers. A couple are built for holding only positive numbers for our chars, which is they map. We map a number to a character. A couple are for holding floating point values. And then finally we have this guy called a Boolean, which holds trues and falses. Trues and falses. So we just put that here, true or false. Okay. That's the kind of values that Booleans hold. Now, next thing we need to talk about is something called a Boolean expression. A Boolean expression is any expression that boils down to a single value of true or false. Remember earlier I talked about those mantras? Primitive type, built into language, only hold the value. Boolean expressions, it's any expression that boils down to a single value of true or false. Eventually, you might shorten that to just a Boolean expression is true or false. True or false. Okay? Any expression that boils down to a single value of true or false. And the reason why that aspect is important, and we'll explore it here in the next several minutes, um, is that sometimes Boolean expressions look complex. But the reality is they still boil down to one value. Okay? So uh, a skill set we're going to learn in here is how to uh, walk through an expression and resolve it like the computer would. And ultimately understand what it comes out to be. Okay? Um, think of this kind of like if you're making, um, you know, making dinner, making a lasagna or something like that. You have a whole bunch of individual ingredients and you throw them together in a bunch of different ways. So it's this big complex pile of stuff. But in the end, the output is a single lasagna. Okay? Because all those other things have done their work. We've, you know, we've, we've, the, the cheese is melted, the eggs are, you know, whatever it is. All the, all the stuff has melded together in whatever way with the heat. And now we have food. Make sense? So Boolean expressions are similar to that. If I just put a pile of ingredients on the table, you wouldn't necessarily be able to tell me, oh, that's a lasagna. Okay? But all those together, if handled properly, turn into a lasagna. Make sense? So a Boolean expression is any expression that boils down to a single value of true or false. So we have some things called Boolean operators. Boolean operators. The arithmetic... Boolean operators are things like, and you know, you've seen these before, less than, greater than, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, equal to, not equal to. Okay? And none of these have spaces. All the ones that are two characters long, there may not be a space between those. Okay, so this is less than, greater than, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, equal to, not equal to. Okay? Now, if I were actually going to put an additional thing on here, I would say these are the primitive, primitive arithmetic Boolean operators. And the important thing with that is these guys only work on primitive types. Okay, they only work on primitive types. So later on, when we start dealing with things that are not primitive types, those objects that I alluded to, these guys won't work on those. We'll have to have alternative ways of accomplishing the same task. Is this object less than this object? Okay? Because it, typically when we think less than, it's a math thing, right? It's a math problem. So even saying that, when we see less than, we're probably going to be comparing numbers. Maybe we'll be comparing characters. Is the letter A less than the letter B? Something like that. 
which works out because they're math based of that, that mapping thing. Um, but what if I said is true less than false? What do you expect the answer to be? It doesn't really make sense, right? Yeah, so it would be an error. So in this case, you might just use your common sense. If you could ask a question is one number less than another number, that makes sense to us, right? Cool. It'll work for that. But if we say is true less than false, doesn't really make sense, probably not allowed. Is true less than seven? Probably doesn't make sense, probably not allowed. Make sense? Okay, so a lot of this is common sense. So these are our arithmetic Boolean operators, mostly for dealing with numbers. So now let's look at a couple of Boolean expressions. I'm going to actually come into Eclipse here. And I will quickly create a new project. All right, so for your homework assignment today, uh, that was due today, uh, you were to write a tutorial for Hello World, okay? Now, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and take you through that steps, those steps real quick with Eclipse. So this is a tool called Eclipse. Um, you can find this tool if you didn't uh, happen to get this one. You can find it at eclipse.org. You'll wanna go to download. Okay, and the one you want is the Eclipse IDE for Java developers. Okay, it'll automatically figure out which operating system you're on. If it didn't, you can do the drop down here. It's available for Windows, Linux, and Mac. Um, so download the 64-bit version. It's fine for any of the platforms. And once you have it, then you can do what I'm about to do. All right, so I created a project. Now I'm going to create a file. I'm just going to call this guy Driver. Uh, I usually like calling my uh, class that drives the program, I call it driver, and that's actually consistent with uh, um, uh, technology. When you get a new graphics card, you install a driver, and that's the program that runs that graphics card, right? So I like to call this guy driver, but you can call him whatever you want. All right, so there's driver. And there's our hello world program, print lin. All right, so this is what the code would have looked like. And we'll talk about some of the pieces of this in a few minutes after I get through Boolean expressions. So when I hit play up here, we get hello world displayed. That's your first working program. Okay. So now we know we have something working. Okay, so now we want to explore Boolean expressions a little bit. A Boolean expression, again, is any expression that boils down to a single value of true or false. Okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to first create a couple of variables. Now remember, in our slide set here, we decided that the way we define variables is the type followed by the variable name equals value. So I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to create an int called a, set equal to 5, call an int b, set that equal to 5. All right, now we've already seen that the way we display crap to the screen is by saying system.out.println. I'll give some explanation about why that works at a later class for right now. That's how you show stuff on the screen, okay? So if I want to say system.out.println a, That'll show A on the screen, all right? And A is five. So when this line runs, before it can run, this variable must be resolved, okay? A variable must be resolved. So A will resolve to its value. Remember, A is the container that's under the bed. 
We have to pull the container out. We have to open it and take what's inside out. That's what A has in it. Does that make sense? All right, so that's what variable resolution is. The act of taking a variable and getting the value out of it. So when I print this out, it should print out a 5 because that's the value stored in A. If I change A to a 9 and don't change anything down here, it'll print out the new value of A, which is a 9. So variables are kind of placeholders. I created this memory called A, put the number 9 in it, and now I can use it at a later date because I remembered it. Remember, variables mimic memory. Make sense? Okay. So now I'm going to print out A less than B. What do you think is going to display? False. Why? A is not less than B. 9 is not less than 7. So this is going to resolve. So what actually shows up here is A is going to resolve to its value, which is a 9. B is going to resolve to its value, which is a 7. We're going to ask the question, is 9 less than 7? That's false. So it's going to display a false, right? Those are false. If it was an older language like C or C++, it would have been a 0. But modern languages like Java and C Sharp, it shows trues and falses. All right, question. Is that a Boolean expression? Can we put the A and B in the same line? If this is one, if this is one integer. So if integer A equals no integer B equals seven, just put them. In. Oh, you want to do you want to do this? Yeah. You can. I don't like it, but you can. Uh, I typically think programming things like that. Um, Yes, you saved yourself one line of code, but I think it's harder to read. Um, so I think that kicking this down to the next line and putting int in front of it, you can now see I have two distinct variables defined, int a and int b. Um, certainly will work uh, to do it the way you were indicating, but um, a rule of thumb I might suggest is that your goal should be to write clear code that first of all works, Secondly, you can understand, and thirdly, somebody else should be able to understand. Your goal should not be to minimize the number of lines. Does that make sense? And it's actually an important thing because it does, when you look at, you know, when you guys are working on your homework and you'll be doing Google searches and looking at other people's code when you can't figure out what to do, that's fine. I want you to do that. Just make sure when you do your homework, you've learned from the code you've looked at because I'll find out on the exam. Okay? okay? If you don't know what you're talking about, I'll know. And the exam's worth enough that I'll, it'll just be funny to me. That's fine. I'm not going to sit here and, you know, dive through your programs looking for cheaters. You know, I don't, I'm in my hot tub. I don't have, care, I don't have time for that. <laughs> All right. But the point is, is that when you are looking at code uh, on the web, looking for some reference to get you in the right direction, because programming is hard. When you first start programming, and for a lot of you, this is just your first, um, you know, your first stab at programming, uh, it's going to be intimidating. You're going to have a lot of errors. You're going to say things in your head like, I've typed in exactly what he typed on the screen, and mine doesn't work, and his does. Something's wrong with Eclipse. Okay. While anything's possible, it's highly likely that you have made an error. Errors like this. You may have forgotten the semicolon. There. That's a common one. Another common one is set, now that you'll be putting semicolons at the end of every line, sometimes you'll accidentally throw semicolons at the end of lines like that. That's a common mistake. If your program's acting funny, maybe go and look at the end of the, some of the lines that aren't supposed to have semicolons, and it's like, oh, if I take that out, maybe good things will happen. Okay? The only thing that gets you to that point is experience. So I'm promising you, when you're doing your homework, you will hate me. Because the things that I make look easy up here, you're going to spend hours on struggling, and you'll be upset. But you, do, you screw up enough times, you'll figure out all the things that don't work, and you'll eventually start stumbling on the things that do work. Uh, I like to talk about computer programming kind of like it's a sport. 
You, uh, you know, Michael Jordan didn't pop out of the womb already a great basketball player. You know, he had to work hard and lots, you know, jump shot after jump shot after jump shot to get good at it. Programming is the same thing. I've already proven to all of you that we're awesome problem solvers. Every one of you. Even, the one, even those of you who don't think you're a good problem solver, you're a good problem solver. I'm willing to bet you missed all the walls again in your way to class today. Right? Okay. We got that in the bag. Now what we need to do is we need to figure out how to talk to this guy. Okay? We're no longer talking to people. We're now talking to a computer. And we're using this new you know, cryptic language, Java, to do this talking to, to do, have this discussion and it's going to be difficult you know even though your assignment tonight is going to be like um you know you could probably write it in five or six lines of code some of you might spend 10 hours in that assignment and hate me every bit of it but i'll tell you what by the end of the eight weeks you'll look back at this assignment and say i could do that in 30 seconds all right so um it's par for the course you're going to spend a lot of time and have a lot of errors and think this isn't worth it, that you're never going to be good at this. And it just is going to take reps. Okay, So the more you work at it... Now, I guess the one thing I might say is this, as a rule of thumb. If you are working on your homework and you are literally just banging your head on the wall and you just don't know what to do next, that's when you have to ask for help. Text me, email me, send me your code saying, this is the problem I'm having. I don't know why this isn't working. You know? I've been doing this a while. I could probably look at the thing you've been staring at for 10 hours and in 20 seconds point out the one thing that's wrong. And then you're now off to the races again until you hit your next wall. <laughs> Make sense? So I, you, you have to utilize the professors. You know, don't just sit there and say, I can't do this. Be reasonable. I don't want you, you know, just dragging on me like, okay, what do I type next? What do I type next? What? Work on it. But if you truly have hit a wall, Ask for help. A lot of times I encourage students, especially in a class like this, to work together. Um, in a graduate class like this, sometimes that's not conducive. People live in different places, have different work schedules, stuff like that. Um, but I don't mind. You know, like I said, I'm not going to be looking at your code for cheating. I don't care. I will find out on the exam. Okay? If everybody's cheating off him for the program, He'll do well on the exam and everybody else won't. Okay? It's up to you guys to learn something in here. I get paid either way. Okay? Once the class has eight students in it, it's a go. We're, that's, I, my check's in the mail. All right? So, you know, it, it, it doesn't matter to me. My job is to give you a grade that indicates how well you've mastered the material. And I'll find out on the exam. Really, the exam is going to dictate your whole grade from my perspective. Everything up to that is practice. Okay? So understand that the homework assignments are your opportunity to get those reps in. Okay, Work hard at it. Ask questions when you hit a wall. Work with uh, somebody else. Do your Google searches. Find somebody else's code, type it in, and see it work. Then figure out, okay, why the heck does this work and mine didn't? That kind of stuff. Okay, It's a lot of experimenting. Just like Michael Jordan stood out in the driveway shooting jump shot after jump shot and how many air balls do you think Michael Jordan had to shoot when he was a kid before he started making all of them? A lot. Okay. Have, put yourself in that mindset. All right. So back to my question here. Is that a Boolean expression? What's a Boolean expression? Any expression that boils down to a single value of true or false. What did that guy boil down to? False. So even though we're looking at a number followed by a weird symbol, followed by another number, once we resolved that expression, the final answer in this case was false. That's a Boolean expression. B less than A. Boolean expression? Yeah. Yep. Boiled down to a single value of true or false. B less than A equal equal B. Well, definitely an error because you see it underlined in red. Right? <laughs> yeah. 
Clips does some of the Microsoft Word stuff. Okay. I don't like what you're doing here. I'm going to underline this in red. You can hover over it. It'll give you some indication. But we're going to resolve this. So B resolves to 7. A resolves to 9. 7 less than 9 is true. Okay? Fine. So this stuff right here ultimately resolves to true. B resolves to what? 7. Now we're asking, is true equivalent to 7? They're not the same type. Comparing apples and oranges. Is this car the same thing as this can of Kool-Aid? Okay, not the same thing. They're not comparable. Make sense? Not a Boolean expression. Is that a Boolean expression? <laughs> yes, it is, because there's no red line. Okay, well, no red line, so it's a legal expression, <laughs> right? It is a legal expression, okay? But is it a Boolean expression? You have to resolve this. I don't have any variables. Don't we need variables to have a Boolean expression? Well, let's resolve this. What does this resolve to? True. It's, it's a literal. The literal value true is already resolved. This isn't a variable name. It's a value. This is the literal value true. So this guy re requires no resolution. That's true. This guy requires no resolution. That's true. Is it true that true is equivalent to false? Is that a true statement? No, it's a false statement. Okay, so question is, is this a Boolean expression? It is a Boolean expression. It boils down to a single value of true or false. In this case, it'll boil down to false. Okay. That's where the single value of comes in. As we're looking at this, we see two Boolean values. That's not a single value. But when we resolve it, we are asking the question, is true equivalent to false? Are those guys the same value? And the answer is no. It is false. They are not the same value. That is a Boolean expression because it boiled down to a single value of true or false. Make sense? All right. A equal to 14. Boolean expression? Yep. A will resolve to its value, which is 9. What will 14 resolve to? 14. It's a literal. That's not in a... We, we, we left our taxes on the floor. It's not in a bucket. Right? It's already there. 14 is 14. No resolution necessary. So this will resolve to 9. We're asking, is 9 the same thing as 14? It's not. That's a false Boolean expression. Make sense? All right. Good. Huh? Um, I'm going to tell you no. <laughs> but the important, let me, let me throw another curveball there. Very important that this operator is the equivalence operator. Two equal signs. You were asking if that exists. Okay? In this circumstance, it does not. There are other places where it does with uh, regular expressions. Um, but don't worry about that. This is the equivalence operator. Two equal signs in a row, no spaces. This guy, though, is the assignment operator. A single equal sign is the assignment operator. On the left-hand side of the assignment operator will always be a variable. The right-hand side will always resolve to a value that better be compatible with the what this variable was built to hold. Okay. 
don't try to put hangers inside of something that was built for shoes. Make sense? All right. So single equal sign is the assignment operator. Double equal sign is the equivalence operator. Double equal sign, that guy is the equivalence operator. Equivalence is it's the arithmetic Boolean operator for checking to see if one value is the same as another value, is equal to. Okay? Single equal sign is used for assigning the value on the right to the variable on the left. Uh, does it check the type first? It checks the type to make sure it makes sense. So for instance, can I say A equal equal true? I can't. This guy is of type int. This guy is of type boolean. And it doesn't make sense to compare integers to booleans. For example, can I compare an um, int with a short? Yes, it can. Yep, so if I if I created a short C is equal to 13, I could say A equal equal C. Those are both of integer type, whole number type. Okay? All right, so that one's a little more interesting. So char C is equal to an A. Let's say, actually, I can't say C because I have a variable called C. We'll call that D. Char D is equal to A. So you want to know, can I say this? No red line. Okay. We have to resolve, resolve it. What does A resolve to? A resolves to 9. What does D resolve to? The char A. Chars are always surrounded by single quotes. That's how we indicate that that's a uh, char. If I don't have single quotes there, what does Java think that is? Think it's the variable named A. Does that make sense? If I don't have double, if I don't have single quotes around that, it thinks A is the integer, the variable named A. When I put single quotes around it, now this guy just became a literal. This is the letter A. So I'm comparing. 9 to the letter A. Does that make sense? Why isn't it screaming? It actually does make sense. There's my uh, char. Whole integer. Chars, even though they even though we like to think of them as holding characters, they're actually holding numbers which map to a character on the Unicode, um, uh, the Unicode character set. And I'll kind of show this to you real quick. I'll have to show you typecasting real and we won't talk about it, but I'll just do it so you see it work. So right off the bat, you're going to see this. So if I say A equivalent to D, this is going to be false. Why? It just so happened that the number 9 was not the same number as A is in Unicode. All right. Now, what I'm going to do real quick is I'm going to print out the integer version of what D holds. This will be the integer version of the letter A, which is the number 97. So A is 97 on the Unicode character set on the mapping. So now if I make A a 97 and I say A equal equal D, now it's true. Okay? Because D being a char actually stores an integer. When I go to display it, Java notices that, oh, this guy is of type char because Java is a strongly typed language. 
It notices that this guy is of type char, and therefore, I need to go and look it up on the Unicode table before I display something. Because the user wants me to give him a char, not a number. But a second ago, when I put the little parentheses before it and said int in there, I was overriding that, telling Java, no, nah, I want the number. Give me the number, don't do the mapping. That makes sense? So is this, is this a Boolean expression? Yeah, boiled down to a single value of true or false. All right, that makes sense? Go ahead. One have to do the, uh, the Unicode of likewise. Because from uh, A um, to the D, they have 7, yep. which is true. But based on the, the list, mm -hmm. it wasn't there. Well, 97 mm -hmm. is the uh, Unicode value of A. If I go onto the Unicode table and I go down to 97, there will be an A right next to it. Because Unicode is a mapping table. So there's a Unicode value for 0, for 1, for 2, for 3, to 4, and those are chars. We hold the integer version. At runtime, it gets mapped to the character version. And let me show you what I mean by that. So if I print out A here, A is an int, right? A is an integer. So if I print this out, it's going to print out a 97. That's what A holds. It holds the number 97. Okay, so there's my 97. Now, if I use that little trick that I haven't taught you about yet, and I throw a char in front of that, I say, by the way, Java, I would like you to treat this integer as if it's a char. It will then go and look it up on the Unicode table and show me the A. So it actually did the mapping because I told it to. I said, treat this int as a char. So if you had that the 97 as a B or a C, it would come back with the A. Let's make it a 98. That'll be a B. 99. Makes sense? Yeah. And that's how the Unicode character set works. Computer store numbers. This document has numbers mapped to letters, or to characters, not only letters, there's a bunch of stuff in there. And, you know, we can always just pick our favorite number, too. So uh, anything between 0 and 65,535. So let's do 1245. Now, I'm taking a risk here because the terminal here in Eclipse isn't able to show all the numbers, all the characters. It's actually only ASCII compliant. So who knows what's going to actually display when I put 1245. It might be a question mark, which is uh, means it didn't know what to do. But I promise you it's trying to map whatever the character version of 1245 is. Let's see what we get. Yeah, got the question mark. That's, that's, I didn't know what to do. Yeah, let's, let's do, uh, let's do the 12. Seventeen. It doesn't know how to do any of those. Oh, well, that's D. Okay, that's fine. One sixty. Right. Terminal doesn't know how to do, not how to handle it. So, but I promise you, there's actual characters mapped to those. All right. So does this all make sense? So you think you completely understand Boolean expressions? So I'm about to trick you. <laughs> What's the output of this program going to be? Let me ask you another way. Is this a Boolean expression? Now, hold on. You guys told me you understood this crap. It's a Boolean value, so not a Boolean expression. You think it is a Boolean expression? Oh, now you got him guessing. Because if there is not a, there's a logic. I think it's a logic. 
You think it is a Boolean expression? No, it's a, a Boolean value. Boolean value. Yeah. Okay, and what, what do you think? So the result would be true. Well, that doesn't answer whether it's a Boolean <laughs> expression or not. Is this a Boolean expression or not a Boolean expression? Well, didn't you raise your hand when you said that you understood this stuff? Uh, what's, what's, remind me, what's a Boolean expression? Value only true or false. Okay, anything that boils down to a single value of true or false. What's the output of this guy going to be? True. True. What's a Boolean expression? Anything that boils down to a single value of true or false. Is this a single value of true or false? So the question is, can a Boolean value also be a Boolean expression? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Where this tricks us is that it seems so simple. Where is the expression part? A literal in and of itself resolves to itself. This literal true boils down to true, which is in fact a single value of true or false. This is a Boolean expression, and it happens to be true. That makes sense? Now do you understand Boolean expressions? Yeah. <laughs> I maybe have tricked students with that before. Uh, what was I talking about? Ah, Boolean expressions. Good. Okay. So those are your arithmetic Boolean operators. Um. We didn't actually look at the example, but this is the not equal operator. Exclamation point followed by a single equal sign. That returns true if two things are not the same. So, not a huge deal there. Next, we have the primitive logical Boolean operators. We have the AND operator, the OR operator, the NOT operator. Okay? Um, there's actually three additional ones, and I'll show them to you here in a few minutes. If I forget, somebody remind me. You'll never use them. And by never, I mean you'll rarely use them. And by rarely, I mean you'll never use them until you're a much, 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 much more advanced programmer. And you'll know why you need to use them. But I will introduce them to you. But these are these are our bread and butter uh, logical Boolean operators. Okay? Double ampersand, no spaces, is the and. Double vertical bar, no spaces, is the or. And a single exclamation point is the not operator. Make sense? All right. So let's go and look at these. First of all, and and, this is just like real life, if we say something, we say something and something else, in order for us not to be lying, we must be, be, we must be truthful about both, okay? For instance, if I said that it's sunny and cold out right now, that's a false statement. It's not sunny out. It's 9 after 9 p.m. You could say, well, it's sunny somewhere, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, in order for that statement to be true... Both statements would have had to be, both parts of the expression would have needed to be true because I used the and. Now, what if I were to say it's sunny or cold? True. It's a true statement. Uh, I don't know why I wasted my time saying it was sunny, but if at least one side of the expression is true, the entire thing is true for an or. So, if at least one side of the expression is true, the entire expression is true. And that's actually an important thing to remember. Um, not only that you know it, but that Java knows that as well. We will run into situations sometimes where Let's say you have an or, and a whole bunch of things or together. And let's say the very first thing is false. Do we even need to check the rest? 
For an and, no. For an or, yes. Okay? If it's an and, we wouldn't have to check the rest. Because for an and, if at least one side of the expression is false, the entire expression is false. So we might have a whole bunch of questions we're asking in a row. And with an and, if we run into even one false, we're wasting our time checking the rest. Okay? Now, where this can come in handy is a situation like this. Let's say we're looking at uh, a string. So we have like the string hello. And before, and it's in, stored in a variable somewhere. So I might say, if the string has greater than zero characters in it, and bucket zero, the very first character in it is an H, do something. Well, what if the string is empty? What if it is of length zero? The first bucket of it doesn't hold anything. That would be an illegal position in the string. So if I were to ask that question, I'll just kind of show you the example here. So I'll say string s, and I haven't introduced strings yet, and I still haven't. So just bear with me. So I might do a system.out.println uh, s dot length greater than zero and s dot char at zero equal to h. Okay, in this particular uh, case, would you say this looks like a more complex looking thing? That is a Boolean expression though. Okay, when we boil it down, s dot length is the number of characters in s, which in this case is five. Is five greater than zero? It is. And s dot char at zero says, give me the character at bucket zero of this string. And we'll talk about strings when we talk about strings. So I'm not introducing strings here. I'm introducing the Boolean expression thing. So Bucket zero is the char h, so this guy boils down to the char h. Is the char h equivalent to the char h? It is. So this would be true. Okay, no problem. Now, I'm going to make my string empty. There's nothing in that string. Make sense? Well, is the length of that string greater than zero? It's not. That will be false. So I will not even check this side. Which is good because bucket zero does not exist. All right, so this will give me a false. Java knew that since I was using an AND and the left side was false, it didn't even have to look at the right side. Okay, now let me show you the alternative. I'll turn this back into hello. So now the length is greater than zero. And now, just to exaggerate it, we'll try to access bucket 1,000 of that string. Certainly, hello does not have 1,000 characters in it, right? So I've tried to access an illegal position in it. We might say, oh, well, this is false. Because bucket 1,000 is not equal to h. Instead, I'm going to get an error, a runtime error, array and data index out of bounds exception. Bucket 1000 does not exist in string s. That guy only has bucket 0 through 4 because there's only five characters in it. Okay? So, in this case, since the first part was true, I went ahead and tried to resolve the second part, which got me into trouble. But when this was the empty string, meaning the length of that string was not greater than zero, it doesn't even try the second half. So I don't get into trouble. Make sense? So this allows us to build Boolean expressions where the second part of it is reliant on the first part being true. So we can ask potentially dangerous questions like this knowing that we will only ask this question if this first part is true. 
since we're asking a thousand here, we might say if s dot length is greater than a thousand, because it needs to have a length of at least a thousand in order for this to work, right? All right, so that kind of makes sense with ands. Now with an or. So we see this is false right here when, with the current setup, where I'm checking bucket 1,000, you can see it equals to an H, but the length is zero, so I fail there. But if I switch this to an OR instead of an AND, the rule for an OR says if at least one side is true, the whole thing is true. Well, as soon as this guy fails, that's false. We can't just stop. Now we're going to test the other side and see if we find a true in there. And we're going to get our error again. String index out of bounds exception. This bucket 1000 does not exist in a string that has no characters. Okay? So that's ands and ors. You already told me that's a Boolean expression, right? So this will print out a true. What will that print out? Not true. I'm using the not operator. So the not operator comes before a Boolean value. And it flips it. So not true is false. Not false is true. <clears throat> is five equivalent to ten? Nope, that's false. What if I put not out front? Got to resolve it. I've put the not in front of the five. What's five? What is five? Five is an integer literal. So what's not five? Does it make sense? Right? Not five doesn't make sense. It doesn't flip it. Okay, there is no antithesis to five. So this guy right here doesn't make sense. Now, if instead I put parentheses here and I say solve this Boolean expression first, which gives me a false, then flip the answer to the other one. Not false becomes true. See the difference there? Okay, so we got to be careful how things resolve. So when I just put not five like that, it tries to apply the not operator to an integer literal, just the number five. And now it stops making sense. I don't know what not five means. I know what not true means. It means false. I know what not false means. It means true. And those are the only nots that make sense to me. Oh, I mean, it won't run. It'll give us compile error. Yeah, so the, the, if you hover over it, it'll tell you the error. It's going to say uh, the operator uh, exclamation point not is undefined to the argument type int. You can't apply the not operator to an int. So this is not a runtime exception. This is a bad code compile error. Okay, so that's the not operator. Okay, now I told you that I would show you, well, mention a couple of other ones. We also have the exclusive or operator. So this is an XOR. Exclusive or is like an or, but at most one side may be true. So an or says one or the other or both. An exclusive or says one or the other, but not both. So if I were to say it is it is dark, exclusive or 
um, cold. That's a false statement because both of my statements were true. And the exclusive or is false for two truths. So or is one or the other, but not, I'm sorry, or is one or the other or both. Exclusive or is one or the other, but not both. Another way of putting it, you might say an or is at least one true. An exclusive or is at most one true, but at least one true. Two falses, exclusive or together, is still a false. You got to have a true in there. Okay, So it's at most one true, but also at least one true. Make sense? So that's the exclusive or. You'll rarely use that because you can build that same functionality with the other ones. Um, then you have bitwise operators. This is the bitwise or. This is the bitwise and. Okay? Uh, bitwise or bitwise and. What this does is, um, so for instance, I could say um, so right off the bat, we're like, okay, this is weird. Five is a literal. That's the number five. Three is a literal. That's the number three. Well, this is the OR operator. Well, five or three, there's no trues and falses in here, right? That's where the bitwise part kicks in. We've talked about five. We've talked about the way numbers are stored as bits. So let's say five is a 32-bit number, and three is a 32-bit number. What the bitwise OR does is it takes the... Um, so here, let me... Let's do this as uh, number five would be one zero one. That's a five, right? This is the four's place, the two's place, the one's place. So four plus one is five. A three would be zero one one. Okay. So bitwise or does it on a per bit basis. So this is. 0 or 1, which is 1. This is 0 or 1, which is 1. This is 1 or 1, which is 1. See how that works? Okay. Very specific things does that is that useful for. That's not a Boolean expression as I've advertised it. This is more for masking like IP addresses and things like this. So... When I ORed these together, I took the binary version of 5 and the binary version of 3, and on a bit-by-bit -bit basis, the 1 and the 0, the 0 and the 1, the 1 and the 1, I performed an OR, producing either zeros or 1s. My answer was the number represented by the result, in this case, 7. Uh, you, uh, you can, uh, well, yes, you can. You'll have to use the binary. Uh, there's a class LI to convert. We're we'll actually be writing something like that in here. You'd have to convert it back. You won't be able to see it as that because uh, there's no way for us to represent directly. We'd have to do it as a string. We can't represent binary numbers directly. So I guess the short answer to your question is no, not directly. We'd have to do something to it to see it. Correct. <coughs> Similarly, if I and this, now it's going to say 1 and 0 is 0. 0, 1. So now the answer is 1. See how that works? Okay. It's used for different types of problems, all right? Not really part of what we'll be discussing in here, but they do exist. And kind of an important thing to show it to you because 
know that our logical operators are doubles. Two ampersands in a row, no spaces. Two vertical bars in a row, no spaces. Does that make sense? All right. So if you accidentally use a single one, you're solving a very different problem. Okay? Uh, and things will go south quick. All right. Now, arithmetic operators plus, minus, times, divide, and modulus. All right. And we know what most of these do, right? Plus adds two things together. Minus subtracts two things. Multiply multiplies two things. Divide divides two things, but divide and modulus work hand in hand. And let me show you that. What's five divided by three? One point something? It's yeah. <laughs> so one. Five is of type integer. Three is of type integer. So when I do the division, the result will be an integer. This is doing integer division. Or well, for those of you who've had third grade, this is long division. Right? This is long division. Now if I say 5.0 divided by 3, now I get my 1.66 because I involved a floating point number. Okay? But I still want to do the 5 divided by 3. 3 goes into 5 how many times? Once. With what left over? Remainder 2. So 5 divided by 3 is the one. Five mod three is the two. So there's the one for the five divided by three. There's the two for the five mod three. That's long division, right? Three goes into five once. One times three is three. It takes two more to get to five. So there's a remainder of two. Make sense? So question. The result of a positive number n mod a positive number x will be in what range? So if I take some positive number n and I mod it by another positive number x, the result will be what? So if you want an example, if I take the number 13,021 and I mod it by 7, 0 to 6 for that example. So the correct answer to this one would be a positive number n modded by a positive number x will have a result in the range of 0 to x minus 1. Okay, Why not x? So I use the big number, what, 13,000, whatever. And I said mod 7, you told me the answer would be 0 to 6. Why wouldn't it be 0 to 7? Well, that means 7 goes into it again. I did bad division, right? Like you would never say 14 divided by 7 is 0. Uh, well, let's see, what do we say? 14 divided by 7, you would never say that it is 0 remainder 14. Right? <coughs> 
So one in an extra time. It's two. Are you in, uh, well, actually the better example there would be, if you said 14 divided by seven, you wouldn't say it's one remainder seven. It's two. Seven goes in a second time. So you would never have a remainder of your divisor. Make sense? Um, so for any positive number n modded by any positive number x, the result will always be zero to x minus one. Very, 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 very important. Okay. Okay, so that's Boolean operators. Ask questions. We have something called a conditional. Conditionals in Java fall into the category of if statements and switch statements. We're going to ignore switch statements. Nobody uses them. Okay. Uh, so the syntax for an if statement is if, all lowercase, followed by an opening parenthesis, Followed by a Boolean expression. What's a Boolean expression? Any expression that boils down to a single value of true or false. So if, followed by an opening parenthesis, followed by a Boolean expression, followed by a closing parenthesis, followed by an opening curly brace, followed by zero or more statements, followed by a closing curly brace. That's the syntax for an if statement. Okay, now let me show you one of these in practice. We'll say int a equals 5. If a is less than 10, woot. All right, so my current value of a is 5. This, is this a Boolean expression? Yep, because it boils down to a single value of true or false. If we resolve it, A resolves to 5. Is 5 less than 10? True. So since this Boolean expression is true, we will execute the body of the if. So this will print out woot. Okay. Similarly, if I change this to 50 and change nothing else, now when we ask the question, is 50 less than 10? It's not. This is false. Since that's false, we will not execute the body of the if. So the output of this program will be nothing. No output. Make sense? Now, with an if, we may optionally have an else. Zero more statements. Okay, but the else is optional. It's not required. We just proved that. I didn't have an else with my if. So I can now throw in here, I can say else Boo. So A is 50, 50 less than 10, nope. So since that's false, we will not execute this, but we will execute the else. So this will print out boo. If I change this back to the five, is five less than 10? Yes, that's true. So we will execute the if but not the else. This is one or the other. Okay, so this will print out woot. Make sense? This allows us to ask a question. If this is true, do this. 
otherwise, but not required, we don't have to have an else, but in this case I do, otherwise, do this. Make sense with the if and else? Now let me show you a little change here. A is currently five, right? Is five less than 10? Yes. So will I execute the body of this if? Yes, so it'll print out a woot. What about this line? This isn't part of the if. This happens every time, no matter what happens, right? So this will print out woot, and then it'll print out boo. If I make this 50, it'll just print out boo, which is the same output as we had the last time we made it 50, but it got to the output differently. Okay? It didn't ask this question, get a false, and do the else. In this case, it just asked this question, saw it was false, skipped past the F, and just kept going. And the next thing it said to do is print out boo. All right, so we get our boo. Make sense? So that's asking questions. Not too bad. So we've covered memory. We've covered asking questions. Repetition. We do it through something called loops. Okay, we have three different kinds of loops. We have for loops, we have while loops, and we have do while loops. Okay, now for the sake of time today, I'm only going to introduce the for loop to you but I'm only going to introduce it so far as how it works because it's not an important aspect of our uh, homework assignment. We'll go into detail about the loops next time. I'm starting to see some glazed. <laughs> All right. Um, I don't think you'll retain it if I talk about loops in too much detail right now. But that's okay. I'm going to show you a for loop, which will be enough information for you to do for your assignment. And while I'm uh, doing that, let me just go ahead and introduce the assignment. So you can see it in context. Because uh, the assignment uses a loop, but it's not about loops. Okay. Uh, so let me jump in here real quick. I think that is something you learn over the years. You can speak to this. You start noticing when you're losing the group. <laughs> when the ones who are like really paying attention early on start like glazing over. <laughs> It's like, wait a minute. Shake things up. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm pretty engaging, but there is a point in there where, okay, let's see. This is 535? Yep. Yeah, uh, so the assignment's already up. Uh, there's a paper. You're going to hate this paper. Um, uh, I'll talk about it a little bit, just so it takes some of the stress off. But... Um, uh, so the programming assignment, you're going to be writing a Java program that counts the number of numbers between 1 and 1 million that are evenly divisible by 9, 13, 27, or 81. Okay. The number of numbers between 1 and a million that are evenly divisible by at least one of those numbers. See where I'm going with this? I want you to properly use the ands or ors. Um, try to figure out what it means to ask the question is something evenly divisible by something else. Okay, that's the problem I want you to struggle through. Okay, you, struggle? Huh? Right? That's a struggle. Thanks. Okay. okay. So you've learned everything you need to know, do in order to, to solve that problem. The one thing you're missing is the loop. Okay. The thing that takes you on a journey through the numbers between one and a million. So I'm going to go ahead and give you that information. I'll just introduce the loop to you real quick with an example. Actually, I said one to a million, right? It's 100,000. That's a million?
Okay. So, this is going to take a little time to run. Okay. But this loop will take, this loop starts off at 1. So I starts off as 1. It keeps going as long as I is less than, as I say, up to a million. So less than or equal to. This keeps going as long as I is less than or equal to a million. And each time through the loop, it adds 1 to I. So the first time through this loop, it'll print out, well, I starts off as 1. Is 1 less than or equal to a million? It is. Print out a 1. 1 becomes 2. Is 2 less than or equal to a million? Yep. Print out a 2. 2 becomes 3. Is 3 less than or equal to a million? Yep. Print out a 3. 3 becomes 4. So on and so forth. Is a million less than or equal to a million? Yes, because it's equal to it. So we'll get through one more time. So we'll print out a million. A million becomes a million in one. Is a million in one less than or equal to a million? It's not. We're done. Okay? So what this program does right now is it displays to the screen every single number between one and one million, inclusive. Okay? What I want your program to do is count the number of those numbers that are evenly divisible by at least one of those values that I provided. And you are counting how many of those. So that means if out of the million numbers you find 60 of them that are evenly divisible by one of those numbers, your program should output 60. That was the number of numbers that it found that were evenly divisible by one of those values. Make sense what I'm asking you to do? Okay. And just to show you here, the program is going to take some time to run because uh, we'll learn in here, I.O. is very expensive. So displaying something to the screen takes a lot of time. Okay, so this is going through all the numbers between 1 and a million. And notice... If I just say done here, but instead of printing each time through the loop, maybe I have a um, integer called count, and I just say count is equal to count plus one. I'm still looping through a million times, but you're going to see this program runs almost instantly. All those print statements that were happening when I had to print a million times. Printing, even though we think of it as very as a very simple task, as far as the magic tricks go on the CPU, printing to the screen is very expensive. You have to constantly pause the CPU because it needs to be interrupted so it can do I.O. Okay, so kind of a lesson in operating systems there. So everybody understand the purpose of this loop here in terms of what it does? We'll talk about the details of this loop next time. I'm just promising you as of right now, you have a for loop that will take I on a journey between 1 and 1 million inclusive. So inside this loop, each time through, I will be 1, then it will be 2, then it will be 3, then it will be 4, then it will be 5, then it will be a million, and then you're done. Make sense? Just by counting? Well, that's what it does now. That's what it does now. Okay? You're going to have to add the necessary code to check. So the program already goes through all the numbers between 1 and a million. I gave you the code that will go through all of the numbers between 1 and a million. What you're going to have to do is you want to check each of those numbers and see is it evenly divisible by at least one of these. If it is, you want to count it. So if I find, as I use this example, if I find 60 numbers out of those 1 million, that are evenly divisible by 9 or 13 or 27 or 81, I'm going to count it, keep a tally. And then in the end, I want to display how many numbers between 1 and a million I found that were even, evenly divisible by one of those, at, at least one of those. Make sense? You say they're not together, they're using the loop? You're going to be using the loop. Yeah, you're going to be, you're going to be using the loop. This guy is going to take I through all the numbers between 1 and a million. Then you need to do something in here, test each number to see if it is 
evenly divisible by one of those four numbers. Count it if necessary. Okay, so I've given you a starting point here. Actually, I gave you even a bigger starting point. I even gave you a counter. All right. So that's the programming assignment. The paper. So write a three to five page paper describing the use of Java in the first Intel version of the Solaris operating system by Sun Microsystems, now owned by Oracle. Uh, so the paper should contain at least topics related to performance, security, hardware compatibility, and user experience. So here's the scoop. I'll give you a little background on this uh, to kind of point you in the right direction. Um, you're going to have to dig pretty hard to get a lot of information on this. Um, but what I want you to use is utilize some of your own knowledge that we've learned in here to draw some conclusions related to how Java functions in this. So, Solaris 7 was the last version of Solaris that was only for the Spark chip, Sun Spark chip. When Solaris 8 came out, they had an Intel version of Solaris 8 for Intel. And built into that was, uh, this, that's when Sun Microsystems started seeing the uh, writing on the wall that they needed to support somebody else's hardware than just theirs because they were losing market share. Well, because Sun made Java, they heavily incorporated Java into Solaris 8, that operating system, heavily. And that had some ramifications, both positive and negative, for the operating system in terms of its performance, its security, its hardware compatibility, and user experience. Okay? So I'm targeting you in on look at Solaris 8 as your starting point. Because the Java, uh, in, them using Java started and ended with Solaris 8. Okay, So the punchline is it wasn't a very good idea for them. Okay, It certainly had some bonuses, but the negatives outweighed those. So I want you to explore this through the perspective of how did using Java impact the performance of an operating system? How did using Java impact the, the security of that operating system? Um, uh, did it have any impact on hardware compatibility? So a lot of these questions you're going to be answering it through the lens of the virtual machine. So for example, if I'm just giving you a, a really, really high level, you've got to fill some pages here with this, but really high level performance, we're probably going to assume that the Java virtual machine hurt us, right? Using a virtual machine to run even portions of the operating system will hurt performance. Now, having said that, using a virtual machine may help security because you've now abstracted stuff away from the actual data because you have to go through this middleman. You have a bouncer at the door, okay? Um, hardware compatibility, you might say maybe there isn't an effect because Java sits above the operating system and the hardware. The virtual machine's doing all the heavy lifting. So maybe hardware compatibility had no impact. Something you might look at is, because you were using Java, were you able to use a larger range of hardware um, than existed, than you were able to use with a Unix operating system like Solaris before, uh, because Java was, was less proprietary? Something like that, okay? So you have to consider that uh, Solaris was a very proprietary Unix operating system made specifically for their own hardware until Solaris 8 came out when they allowed you to run their operating system on other people's hardware. So there's certainly going to be hardware compatibility discussion in there, both related and unrelated to Java. Make sense? Uh, lastly, the user experience. And this is going to go into a couple of different categories. Uh, um, one hand, they put a lot of Java applets throughout the interface, uh, which kind of brought the interface to life. So re really, Solaris 8 maybe had one of the, um, the early, you know how uh, uh, Windows 7, Windows 8, things bounce around and stuff like that? Like, you, you know, uh, you feel like it's alive. Solaris 8 had a little bit of that. Um, 
but it was happening through the Java virtual machine, which maybe had some sluggishness. So talk about the user experience through that perspective. Okay, so I think I've kind of given you some decent starting points to grab onto uh, with that. Um, but you're going to have to draw some of your own conclusions about what you've learned about Java for this. So if you start digging into this and you find there isn't tons and tons of uh, information, part of it's because this was only for one release of the operating system before they realized it was a huge mistake. And secondly, it wasn't a super popular operating system. Okay? Um, but I think I've given you enough to chew on to, uh, um, to, to be able to write the paper. All right? Questions, comments, concerns, bribes. I think about this. Uh, if this mapping is being by today, what will be the consequence? If the uh, uh, if we made a Java-based operating system today, um, well, Android you got to consider is more specialized. So instead of it, I mean, you could say it's fairly general purpose, but it is still a, it's a mobile operating system. Uh, I think Android being written in Java adds a lot of security to Android, but I think the openness of the Android operating system puts a lot of those security problems right back in. Um, so that's a problem with Google having their source code open source. You know, anybody can grab Android and look at exactly how it works. Um, but if we if we had a new operating system today that was written in Java, I think it would still be a problem. We wouldn't, we, I mean, the slowdown would be less severe, but why would you want it to slow down when it could run faster? You know? You already have some applications specifically for if you've ever like VPNed or uh, uh, remoted into another computer. A lot of times they, they want to turn off some of the uh, animation stuff. It'll make it run smoother. Um, so right off the bat, if you're, if you're hurting performance in any way possible, you're probably not doing yourself a service. I don't think there's real gains to implementing an operating system in Java other than just saying I wrote an operating system in Java. Uh, unless maybe you wrote an operating system that launched out of a web browser, which I think somebody did. I think somebody actually wrote a version of Linux that launches out of a web browser that was written in Java. But that's more of a geeky hobby thing than a useful, people are going to use this thing. Make sense? All right, I will see everybody on Wednesday. Um, Remember, and hey, actually, just so it's on the recording in case I forgot uh, to tell you earlier, um, let me just give you my email address and my cell phone to text me. So if you do run into trouble, I want you to ask for help, okay? Don't bug me. Ask me a million questions. But I don't want you to beat your head on the wall for 10 hours, okay? So email is that. If I don't reply within an hour, probably send it again. I get about 700 emails a day. I own several companies, so I get emails all into one place. Similarly, that's my cell phone. You can call it if you want, but I probably won't answer. Um, I don't, I'm not really a phone talker, but text me. Feel free to text me. Just tell me who you are. Ask your question. I'll reply back. Really, text is probably the best way to get a hold of me. Email's pretty good, too. Either one of those, you're going to get a pretty fast response. Okay? But if you don't hear back right away, send it again. It's because I get, a, I mean, I get a, inundated with a lot of messages. If I look at my phone right now, unread text, texts is 133. Okay? Uh, unread email, 2,111. 2,111. Okay, so bump yourself to the top of the inbox. I won't be offended. All right? All right, I will see everybody next Wednesday.